Stop it. We're live at the Brown County Courthouse where the woman you just saw having a wild explosion at her own attorney is 25-year-old Taylor Shab Business. She had just been recently convicted of the brutal killing and dismemberment of her boyfriend Shad Therian inside a Green Bay home in February of 2022. This case has gripped the nation with its horrifying details and the shocking nature of the crimes committed. She was charged with first-degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, and third-degree sexual assault. The trial began with the prosecution painting a vivid and disturbing picture of the events that unfolded inside the Green Bay home in February of 2022. Brown County District Attorney David Lacey described the crimes as bizarre, strange, and unnatural, but emphasized that the evidence made it abundantly clear what had transpired. The prosecution argued that show business meticulously planned and executed the heinous acts, presenting evidence that pointed to premeditation. They highlighted the fact that Shab Business had admitted to strangling Shad Therian during her interrogation. Green Bay Police Detective David Grab testified that Shea Business had used knives from the kitchen to carry out the grisly crime. The prosecution argued that Shea Business knew Therian's body was too large to be easily disposed of, leading her to dismember him. In contrast, the defense attempted to cast doubt on the case, questioning the reliability of Shea Business's statements due to her alleged drug use. Shea Business's attorney, Christopher Froelich, argued that it was difficult to determine her intent when she was under the influence of drugs. He urged the jury to consider the possibility that Shea Business his actions were not premeditated, but rather a result of her impaired state. Froelich challenged the jury to question whether they could trust the statements made by someone who was hopped up on meth on drugs. He argued that the state wanted the jury to delve into Shea Business's mind to determine her intent, a task he deemed difficult given the circumstances. The defense aimed to create doubt in the minds of the jurors, suggesting that Shea Business may not have intended for Therian to die and that her actions were a result of the unpredictable nature of drug use. During the trial, the jury was shown a chilling video of Shea Business's interrogation. In the recording, Shea Business admitted to strangling Shad, Therian, and engaging in other gruesome acts. When asked by the police if she wanted Therian to be dead, Shea Business claimed that it was a random act and that she did not intend for him to die. However, Detective Graff testified that Shea Business had admitted to enjoying the act of strangulation and continued to strangle Therian even after initially claiming she did not intend to kill him. The prosecution argued that Shea Business's actions after the killing further demonstrated her intent. They presented evidence that she played with the body after realizing Therian was dead. The criminal complaint revealed that the victim's head was found in a bucket in the basement of the home, while other body parts were discovered in the basement and in a crockpot box in a van at Shea Business's apartment. Shockingly, Shea Business admitted that she had intended to take all the body parts with her, but had forgotten the head due to laziness. Throughout the trial, a total of 28 witnesses testified for the state, including Shad Therian's family members law enforcement officials, a medical examiner, a DNA analyst, and a friend of both Shea Business and Therian. Their testimonies painted a grim and horrifying picture of the events leading up to and following the murder. The prosecution built a strong case, presenting a wealth of evidence that left little room for doubt. On the other hand, the defense had planned to present a witness, but claimed they were unavailable due to a medical issue. Despite this setback, Judge Thomas Walsh denied the defense's motion for a mistrial. The judge later asked Shea Business if she wanted to testify, but she declined the opportunity. As the trial progressed, the courtroom was filled with tension and disbelief. The shocking and gruesome details of the case left the community of Green Bay and the nation in shock. The trial not only revealed the depths of Taylor Shea Business's depravity, but also raised questions about the nature of her intent and the impact of drug use on her actions. Throughout the trial, Shea Business was seen multiple times grinning as gruesome details about the murder were mentioned. One time during the proceedings, she attacked her lawyer before a deputy wrestled her to the courtroom floor. Let's take a look at the clip. Stop it. Stop it. After the jury found Shab Business guilty of first-degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, and third-degree sexual assault, the trial entered its second phase. This phase aimed to shed light on whether Shab Business was responsible for her actions or if she was suffering from a mental disease or defect that affected her ability to understand the consequences of her actions. The defense sought to present evidence that would support the claim of a mental disease or defect. They aimed to establish that Shea Business was not fully aware of the nature and consequences of her actions 
actions at the time of the killing. This phase of the trial would delve into the depths of Shabaznis's mind, seeking to understand the motivations and mental state that led to the horrific crimes. Throughout this phase, expert witnesses were called to testify and provide insights into Shabaznis's mental state. These witnesses included psychologists, psychiatrists, and other mental health professionals who had evaluated Shea Business. Their testimonies would play a crucial role in determining whether Shea Business was legally responsible for her actions or if her mental state diminished her culpability. My opinion is that she qualifies for the not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. My opinions are that she was not responsible, was not responsible because of a mental disease. The defense aimed to establish that Shea Business was suffering from a mental disease or defect that impaired her ability to understand the wrongfulness of her actions or conform her behavior to the requirements of the law. They presented evidence of Shea Business's history of mental health issues, including diagnoses of various disorders and previous treatment. On the other hand, the prosecution sought to challenge the defense's claims and prove that Shea Business was fully responsible for her actions. They argued that Shea Business's actions demonstrated a clear understanding of the consequences and a deliberate intent to commit the crimes. The prosecution presented evidence of Shea Business's detailed planning, her admission to enjoying the act of strangulation, and her subsequent actions after the killing. The jury was faced with the daunting task of weighing the evidence presented by both sides and determining Shea Business's level of responsibility. They had to consider whether her mental state at the time of the killing absolved her of legal culpability or if she should be held fully accountable for her actions. As the trial progressed, the courtroom was filled with tension and anticipation. The expert witnesses provided compelling arguments and counter-arguments, each side presenting their interpretation of Shabuznis's mental state. The jury listened attentively, carefully considering the evidence and the expert opinions. Ultimately, it was up to the jury to decide whether Shabuznis's mental state diminished her responsibility for the crimes. Their decision would have far-reaching consequences, not only for Shabuznis, but also for the victim's families and the community at large. After weeks of intense courtroom proceedings, the moment of truth arrived as the jury deliberated on the appropriate punishment for Taylor Shabuznis. The nation held its breath, waiting for the verdict that would determine the fate of a woman who had committed such heinous acts. The courtroom erupted in a mix of emotions, relief, sorrow, and a sense of justice served. The guilty verdict provided some solace to the victim's families, knowing that the person responsible for their loved one's brutal murder would be held accountable. The sentencing phase of the trial followed, where the jury had to determine the appropriate punishment for Shabuznis. This phase allowed for further exploration of the impact of the crimes and the defendant's character. Victim impact statements were presented, giving the victim's families an opportunity to share their pain, grief, and the lasting effects of the loss they had endured. The prosecution argued for a severe sentence, emphasizing the heinous nature of the crimes and the need for justice to be served. They highlighted the premeditation, the enjoyment Shah Business admitted to during the act of strangulation, and the gruesome dismemberment of the victim's body. The prosecution sought to ensure that Shah Business would face the full weight of the law for her actions. On the other hand, the defense pleaded for leniency, presenting Shabuznis's troubled past and history of mental health issues as mitigating factors. They argued that Shabuznis's actions were influenced by her impaired mental state and that she should be given an opportunity for rehabilitation and treatment. Before the judge gave his final sentence, he gave Shabuznis a chance to speak. So, Ms. Shabuznis, this is your opportunity to address me if there's anything on your mind you'd like to say before I pass sentence. Okay. The judge, after considering the arguments from both sides, delivered the final sentence. Taylor Shabuznis was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The courtroom was filled with a mix of emotions, relief, closure, and a sense of justice served. I'm going to impose uh, life imprisonment without the, without the possibility of extended supervision. I believe that's appropriate in light of the findings that I've already made. The victim's families could find some solace in knowing that Shabuznis would spend the rest of her life behind bars, unable to harm anyone else.
Today, we bring you a tale that shook the city of Portland, Oregon to its core, the crimes and sentencing of Jeremy Christian. On that fateful day, May 26, 2017, a Max light rail train became the backdrop for a horrifying display of hate and violence. Christian's racist and anti-Muslim slurs targeted two innocent black teenagers, leading to a confrontation that would end in tragedy. But justice was swift, as Christian was arrested and indicted soon after the attack on two counts of second-degree charges of murder and one count of attempted murder. It was a seemingly ordinary day in Portland, Oregon, as the Max light rail train carried passengers to their destinations. But little did they know that this unassuming journey would soon turn into a nightmare. Our story begins on May 26, 2017, when the city became the stage for a shocking display of hate and violence. The train car was filled with a diverse group of individuals, each going about their day. Among them were two innocent black teenagers quietly chatting and enjoying their ride. Unbeknownst to them, their presence would become the target of a man consumed by bigotry and rage. As the train rattled along its tracks, the atmosphere suddenly shifted. Jeremy Christian, a man with a history of extremist views, directed his hateful slurs towards the two girls. His words dripped with racism and anti-Muslim sentiment, creating an uncomfortable tension within the confined space. Sensing the danger escalating, the girls made a wise decision to move away from the source of the vitriol. They sought refuge at the back of the train, hoping to distance themselves from the hateful tirade. But little did they know that their attempt to escape would set in motion a series of events that would forever change their lives and the lives of those around them. Taliesin Namkai Meche and Micah Fletcher, two courageous men who happened to be on the same train, witnessed the unfolding scene of hatred. Their hearts filled with empathy and a sense of justice. They couldn't stand idly by while Christian spewed his venomous words. Namkai Meche, with unwavering resolve, approached Christian and firmly told him to get off the train. Fletcher, equally determined, pushed Christian away, attempting to defuse the escalating tension, but little did they know that their acts of bravery would unleash a wave of violence that would forever scar their lives. In a split second, Christian's rage transformed into a chilling act of brutality. With a knife in hand, he lunged at Namkai Meche, Fletcher, and another unsuspecting passenger named Ricky Best. Chaos erupted as the victims fought for their lives, their screams echoing through the train car. The train car descended into a state of shock and horror. Best, tragically, succumbed to his injuries at the scene, leaving behind a void that could never be filled. Filled. Namkai Meche, despite his valiant efforts, succumbed to his wounds later at the hospital, his life cut short by an act of unfathomable violence. Fletcher, though gravely injured, managed to survive the brutal assault, forever marked by the scars of that fateful day. As panic and confusion gripped the train car, Christian seized the opportunity to escape. He fled the scene, leaving behind a trail of devastation and shattered lives. But his escape would be short-lived, as law enforcement swiftly mobilized to bring him to justice. The authorities acted swiftly apprehending Christian and ensuring that he would face the consequences of his heinous actions. He was arrested and indicted soon after the attack, charged with murder, attempted murder, and other crimes. The wheels of justice were set in motion, but the scars left by this senseless act of violence would forever haunt the victims' families and the community. The attack sent shockwaves through the Portland community, a city known for its inclusivity and tolerance. Hundreds of individuals, united in their grief and outrage, gathered for a candlelight vigil to honor the lives lives lost and to stand against hate. It was a powerful display of solidarity, a testament to the resilience of a community determined to combat bigotry and violence. The trial of Jeremy Christian, a man whose violent outburst on a Max light rail train shook the city of Portland, reached its climax in a courtroom filled with tension and emotion. In this final section, we delve into the trial, the conviction, and the sentencing that would ultimately bring a measure of closure to the victims' families and the community. The courtroom became a battleground between justice and hate as the prosecution presented a compelling case against Christian. Witnesses took the stand, recounting the horrifying events that unfolded on that fateful day. Videos of the incident were played, capturing both the tragedy and the acts of compassion that emerged amidst the chaos. I wish that I could look you in the face as I say this. Your crime, Mr. Christian, was not only the murder of my brother, but robbery. You robbed me of one of my favorite people on this planet. One of the survivors of the attack took the stand, bravely recounting his experience and the profound impact it had on his life. His testimony served as a powerful reminder of the resilience of the human spirit and the strength of those who stood up against hate. After careful consideration of the evidence presented, the jury reached a unanimous verdict. Jeremy Christian was found guilty on all counts, including murder, attempted murder, and other crimes. The courtroom erupted in a mix 
of relief and grief as the families of the victims and the community grappled with the weight of the decision. The conviction brought a sense of closure to the victims' families, who had endured unimaginable pain and loss. It was a bittersweet moment as they grappled with the reality that their loved ones would never return. But it also provided a glimmer of hope, a validation that justice had been served. Now at the sentencing, an impact statement is made by one of the relatives of the victims, and this is where Christian explodes. And to Mr. Jeremy Christian, your mom should have swallowed you. You are a white supremacist. Stop being a white supremacist. And when you die and go to hell, I hope you rot. See you there. Christian, defiant and unrepentant, made several outbursts during the trial. He attempted to justify his actions, claiming self-defense and invoking the notion of free speech. But the evidence presented painted a clear picture of a calculated act of violence, fueled by bigotry and a desire to inflict harm. While nothing can bring back our loved ones, we are grateful for the verdict. It gives us some solace knowing that Jeremy Christian will be held accountable for his actions. This conviction is a step towards healing. We hope it sends a strong message that hate and violence will not be tolerated. The verdict is a reminder that our community stands united against hate. We must continue to work towards a more inclusive and compassionate society. The sentencing phase of the trial brought forth powerful statements from the victims' families who shared their pain and the lasting impact of the attack. Their words resonated throughout the courtroom, leaving an indelible mark on all those present. After Christian is escorted out, the judge delivers the final blow. Sentencing Jeremy Christian, the judge sentences him to two consecutive life terms, with an additional 25 years for his other convictions. It was a moment of closure, a solemn recognition that Christian's actions had forever altered the lives of the victims and their families. While the pain will never fully go away, the sentencing brings a sense of justice. We can now begin to heal and rebuild our lives. The trial and sentencing of Jeremy Christian marked a turning point for the city of Portland. It served as a stark reminder of the dangers of hate speech and extremism, but also showcased the resilience and unity of a community determined to combat such forces. As we reflect on this tragic chapter, let us remember the lives lost, the bravery of those who intervened, and the importance of standing together against hate. In this session at the Seminole County Court, we bring you a chilling account that will leave you speechless. We are going to uncover the crimes and sentencing of Antonio Rosales, a name that has become synonymous with darkness and evil. This 41-year-old homeless man committed unspeakable acts against a 10-year-old girl that shook an entire community to its core, dragging her into the woods, choking her, and then subjecting her to a horrifying Rosales left a scar on the young girl's life that can never be erased. He was charged with kidnapping, attempted murder, and sexual battery. To truly understand the depths of Antonio Rosales's depravity, we must delve into his troubled past. The revelations surrounding his previous crimes shed light on a life marred by violence and a disregard for human life. It was in the early 1990s when Rosales first found himself entangled in the criminal justice system. Guatemalan federal criminal records revealed that he was judged guilty of homicide in 1991 although the details of the case remain shrouded in mystery. What is known is that he was found next to a lifeless woman, a chilling scene that marked the beginning of his descent into darkness. Rosales spent time in a Guatemalan prison, the extent of which remains unknown. Winter Park psychiatrist Jeffrey Danziger, who evaluated Rosales's mental state, testified that he had indeed served time in a Central American prison. The details of his incarceration, however, remain elusive. How much time he spent behind bars and the circumstances surrounding his release are questions that may never be fully answered. But Rosales's criminal history did not end there. In his confession to local authorities four years ago, he revealed a disturbing pattern of illegal entry into the United States. Born in Guatemala, he claimed to have sneaked into the country twice, once in 1995 and again in 2002. However, U.S. immigration records tell a different story. According to Barbara Gonzalez, spokeswoman with U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Rosales has unlawfully entered the United States at least three times. He was deported 
ordered in 1998 and again in 2000, each time sent back to Mexico. The federal government believes him to be a native of Mexico, as he has provided no evidence to support his claim of Guatemalan origin. So how did he end up committing this heinous crime? It was a seemingly ordinary evening in Castleberry, Florida, on November 1st, 2003. The sun was setting, casting an eerie glow over the quiet neighborhood. Little did anyone know that this night would forever be etched in the annals of darkness and despair. As the 10-year-old girl hopped onto her brother's push scooter, her mind filled with thoughts of the grocery store just a few blocks away. Oblivious to the lurking danger, she set off on her innocent journey, unaware that a predator was watching her every move. Antonio Rosales, a 41-year-old homeless man, had made the woods his home. Hidden among the trees, he patiently waited for an opportunity to strike. As dusk settled, he saw his chance. With a sinister intent burning in his eyes, he pounced on the unsuspecting girl, dragging her into the depths of the woods. Fear gripped the young girl's heart as Rosales tightened his grip around her delicate neck. She fought desperately for her life, but the strength of her attacker was overpowering. Slowly, her consciousness slipped away, leaving her at the mercy of this monster. Days turned into weeks, and the community was gripped with fear and uncertainty. Parents held their children closer, afraid to let them out of their sight. The search for the missing girl intensified, with law enforcement agencies and volunteers combing every inch of the surrounding area. Then a breakthrough came. Rosales, unable to contain the weight of his guilt, confessed to the authorities a week after the heinous act. In a chilling admission, he revealed the horrifying details of what he had done to the young girl. He admitted to pulling down her pants and subjecting her to a despicable act of but the horrors of Antonio Rosales' crimes did not end there. Shockingly, he also confessed to an unrelated crime that sent shockwaves through another community. In August 2001, an elderly woman named Dolores N. Salvatierra was found dead in her Tucson home. The connection between Rosales and this heinous act was revealed, painting a picture of a man consumed by darkness and violence. Dolores had shown kindness to Rosales, offering him a place to stay in her garage and even helping him find employment nearby. Little did she know that her compassion would be repaid with such brutality. The revelation of this additional crime left the community reeling, questioning how someone could harbor such evil within them. As the details of Rosales' crimes unfolded, the community demanded justice. The case went to trial, and a jury presented with overwhelming evidence found him guilty of child kidnapping, and attempted first-degree murder. The weight of his crimes was undeniable, and the judge, Circuit Judge Deborah S. Nelson, prepared to deliver a sentence that would ensure Rosales would never walk free again. When Assistant State Attorney Anna Valentini began her closing arguments, out of nowhere, Rosales objected via a translator, and also via his actions. <laughs> As the sentencing approached, with Rosales remaining seated, his eyes devoid of remorse, he displayed his violent nature and unleashed his rage, knocking over the defense table in a fit of anger. It was a chilling reminder of the darkness that resided within him. The judge had to temporarily leave the court. <laughs> In the aftermath, Judge Nelson handed down three consecutive life sentences to Rosales. The mandatory life sentence for the rape charge was just the beginning. The judge, recognizing the severity of his actions, stacked on two additional life sentences, ensuring that Rosales would spend the rest of his days behind bars. The victim, now 15 years old, stood strong alongside her family, silently enduring the pain and trauma inflicted upon her. She did not address the court, but her presence spoke volumes. The scars of that fateful night would forever be etched on her soul. But the conviction of her attacker brought a sense of closure and justice. The events surrounding Antonio Rosales's conviction sent shockwaves through the community. The horrors inflicted upon the young girl and the revelation of his connection to another murder painted a picture of a man consumed by violence and darkness. The judge's decision to hand down three consecutive life sentences was a testament to the severity of his crimes and the need to protect society from such a dangerous individual. If you enjoyed this video, check out our other awesome videos on the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.